Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 25th, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the January 25th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Chair Hen, do you refer to you. From you. Yes, I would like to recommend to the board that item L, the unfinished business work session on the superintendent's proposed FY 2023 operating budget, uh, be postponed, rescheduled to a later date. Thank you. May I have a motion, board members, to postpone item L, work session on the proposed FY 2023 operating budget to a date to be determined prior to the February 8th, 2022 board meeting? So moved, Mac. Second, Thank Rowe. you, Ms. Mac. Thank you for the second, Ms. Rowe. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. The agenda is approved as amended. Thank you. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and nine, conduct con collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairwoman Pasture, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So moved. So moved, Offerman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Thank you for the second, Ms. Mack. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair and Madam 
Vice Chair and the members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. There are five. Assistant Principal at Perry Hall Middle School, Chief of Schools, the Office of the Deputy Superintendent, Executive Director of Middle and High Schools, the Office of the Chief of Schools, and the Executive Director of Social Emotional Support in the Department of Social Emotional Support and the Specialist in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Do I have a second? Second, Ms. Pasteur. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Yes, our for first appointment is Kenneth M. Burlett. I think he is in the room. Uh, as the assistant principal at Perry Hall Middle School. <laughs> Welcome, I think he has some supporters around him. Um, he brings to us 14 and a half years in Baltimore County. He was the uh, school counselor at Milford Mill Academy. He also um, served as a social studies teacher at Milford Mill Academy. Congratulations, Mr. Bertolette. Well, our next appointment is Kimberly S. Ferguson as the Executive Director of Social and Emotional Support in the Department of Social and Emotional Support. I believe she is present with us. Please stand. Previously, <laughs> she served as the Director of Student Support Services. She also has 22 years of service in Baltimore City Public Schools. Congratulations, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you. The next appointment is Jessica E. Grimm as a specialist in the Office of Teaching and Learning. She brings to us 10.5 years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, previously, she was the resource teacher in the Office of Teaching and Learning. She's also served as a special education teacher of inclusion at Lions Mill Elementary, also the instructional support at Baltimore Highlands Elementary and special ed teacher inclusion, Baltimore Highlands Elementary and special ed teacher at Westtown Elementary. She also had previous experience of seven years in Carroll County Public Schools. Congratulations, Jessica E. Grimm. Our next appointment is Dr. Eric Minus. I believe he is present in the room. Please stand as the executive director of middle and high school in the office of the chief of schools. Currently he's serving as the executive director of research and data analytics in the division of research accountability and assessment. His previous experience includes uh, Newport News City Schools for three years, Montgomery County Public Schools over 19 years, and Howard County Public Schools two years. Congratulations, Dr. Minus. <laughs> and next, we have Dr. Michael J. Zarchin as the Chief of Schools in the Office of Deputy Superintendent. He is present. Please stand, Dr. Zarchin. <laughs> Currently, he is the Chief of School Climate and Safety in the Division of School Climate and Safety. Uh, he has served previously in Montgomery County Public Schools for over 27 years and Gwinnett County Public Schools for a year. Congratulations, Dr. Zarchin. Thank you all. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for this policy and for that I call on Ms. Lily Rowe, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, the re policy review committee brings forward policy 7330, facilities and construction, financing capital projects funded by private donations. Um, this is for first reader for this policy. And, and Thank you. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for policy 7330? So moved, Thomas. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Mrs. Causey? I just had discussion when you get to that point. Madam Chair, do we vote on this now or is it just your first reader? It comes to public comment first. Or are, you vo are we voting to accept? Voting to accept the recommendation from the committee. Okay, thank you. And there's no seconds needed. Any discussion? Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Since this policy is at first reader, uh, there is the opportunity for the policy to be amended or um, edited. And I just wanted to let the um, board know and the policy review committee chair that I'll be bringing an amendment to the next meeting uh, in the interest of time because our meeting has started so late to uh, make uh, suggestions for additions to the policy. I have uh, been made aware of a, uh, a <clears throat> donation uh, that was uh, started seven years ago uh, at Hereford High School where the uh, members of the community raised money to restore the historic barn that's on the property because it is part of the agreement of the uh, family that donated the land to the Board of Education to build that high school so many years ago. Um, and I just wanted to uh, put in additional language around uh, timelines and um, oversight in order to um, make sure that those sorts of projects are uh, moved along in a timely fashion. Um, the concern here is Hereford High School has the only agricultural program in the county and uh, the development of a new barn for career and technology classes is being delayed because of this project. So we have programs of education being delayed. Um, I'm also gonna be asking to um, amend it to more clearly identify the all of the donations. So I just wanted to uh, thank you, Mrs. You aware and let the board be aware. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yeah. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic scheduled selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. 
If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of, Inf board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Um, we do not have any um, of those this meeting, so we will go right to general public comment. Our first speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Last month, I noted that several cities around the country were going virtual uh, because of the continuing COVID cases. School districts across the country are starting to recognize the importance of virtual learning in situations such as pandemics and weather. States like Tennessee, who have a law against virtual learning are recognizing that the circumstances of COVID warrant exceptions. When it is not safe for students to be in person in the classroom, virtual learning is an option. When weather prevents students from attending school for more than a couple of days in a row, as it did six years ago, virtual is an option. Last week, students from Montgomery County walked out of their classrooms demanding virtual learning because of their safety and health concerns due to the pandemic. I have heard similar from students in Howard and our own Baltimore County. What are we waiting for? I acknowledge the learning loss and the fact that virtual learning is not for everyone. But let me ask you a question. Aren't students learning instru losing instruction every time they are exposed to COVID and in quarantine? It doesn't matter if the student is absent 10 days or five days. They are not receiving actual instruction, but they are expected to complete assignments. Instruction through virtual platform is an option. However, I am not here just to advocate for virtual learning. I'm here to bring to your attention an alarming trend. Since before the pandemic, parents of students with disabilities have found it increasingly difficult to have their input recognized and therefore get their children's needs met. In the name of least restrictive environment, students are being forced into general education classrooms or inappropriate placements. Schools and the offices of special education and compliance have resorted to bullying and intimidation to get parents to back down. When a parent doesn't agree or is persistent, the only recourse parents have is mediation or if they can afford a lawyer, due process. There is no longer central IEP meetings to try and resolve disagreements. The new administration seems to be less interested in the quality of services and instruction and more interested in continuing the approach of one size fits all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tadanisha Love. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Dr. Williams and members of the school board. My name is Tatanisha Love and I'm a school librarian in Baltimore County. Based upon the proposed budget for the fiscal year of 2022 through 2023, I would like to thank Dr. Williams and the school board for their continued support of school library programs in Baltimore County public school system. By providing funding for school libraries, you are helping to ensure that all students succeed. School libraries provide resources to the entire school community through lessons related to research. School libraries are spaces that encourage inquiry. Through digital citizenship lessons, school librarians promote online safety and proper use of technology. 
Through the purchase of print and non-print materials, school librarians help to ensure that students have access to reading that is entertaining, informative, and engaging. Your continued support of school library programs is one of the reasons why the BCPS Office of Library Services has been nationally recognized for its innovative partnerships and leading edge use of technology. In the future, please consider connecting with school librarians to hear about some of the wonderful programs they offer to students, teachers, parents, and other members of their school community. Whether it is co-planning with teachers, working with students on projects, or partnering with members of the community, I am sure you will be delighted by the examples of collaboration. And before I conclude, my thank you for that, I, do, I would like to state that I would like for you to consider looking into virtual learning uh, as an asset for students, especially in school communities where they're having high numbers of COVID cases. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Vidal. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Ms. Chair, Hen, um, Chair Ms. Hen, and members of the board. I want to thank you for adopting the five-day quarantine that the CDC recommends and which will allow for more staff and students to be in school. I believe this will help with staff shortage and with continuity of education for many children who were quarantined for days when only 1.4% tested positive for COVID. Now that COVID-related decisions are making sense, we should make academics make sense as well. A report from UNICEF published two days ago um, said that globally disruption to education meant that millions of children significantly missed out on the academic learning they would have acquired if they had been in the classroom with younger and more marginalized children facing the greatest loss. The report actually mentions the US and states like Virginia and Maryland, among others, as states where learning losses have been observed. The consequences will be seen for a long time, not only in academics, but also in behaviors, school disengagement, mental health, and increased abuse. Robert Jenkins, the chief of education at UNICEF, said in the report that while the disruptions of learning must end, just reopening schools is not enough. Students need intensive support to recover lost education. It is hard to understand how knowing about such level of learning loss, we continue to have disrupted education at BCPS. As of last Friday, between snow days, asynchronous days, and holidays, our kids had no more than seven days of school in 2022. And that was the lucky ones whose schools were not closed or who were not quarantined. Since we started this school year, only eight weeks out of the 22 weeks have been a five-day week. Our five-day weeks over for good in public school, working parents would like to know. Our community is now calling these snow days rain days because they have been called at over 40 degree temperatures and most had no snow on the ground. I have heard middle schoolers laugh at the situation saying things like, well, it's supposed to be a delay tomorrow, but I bet they will call it a full snow day in the morning. Or this was supposed to be a, a snow day, LOL. We have yet to be informed about how we're gonna make up for, the, for January 10th and January 11th asynchronous days, or what students are parent and parents ca calling now do nothing days. The Maryland State Board of Education wanted all schools to reopen for in-person instruction five days a week, according to the resolution approved in the spring, and any exceptions would require state board approval. Has BCPS asked for an exception? These days should not count as school days because our children were not in school. Parents who can continue to leave the system for many reasons, but most of them because of the answers to questions that go not answered. They have questions about endless prep time for teachers for very little instruction for kids, about in-person learning that continues to be delivered through a screen, and about closures that don't make sense for children. We need, again, to make the system child-focused and include academic outcomes as a standing board agenda item. Academics should be the guide of any school system, and academic outcomes would tell you that we need more Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Stankowski. Good evening. How you doing? COVID-19 is not going away. My name is Rob Stankowski. My goal today is to explain why we don't want to have any more school closures. 
No more mask mandates. Oxygen is your number one antiviral. No PCR testing. The FDA just said uh, the approval, the emergency approval was done away with January of 2022. You're segregating kids by those that are vaxxed and not having a PCR test versus unvaxxed getting tested weekly in order to play sports. There should be no vaccination requirement. What kind of public policy pushes children into anxiety and depression for disease that has little to no risk for them? The CDC, as of January 1st, 22, said there was 140 children hospitalized and since the start of the epidemic was 5,500. At the peak of 2014 and 2015, the flu sent twice as many kids to the hospital. According to the CDC, COVID-19 did not have any increase in deaths over the past. Right now, we have testing that goes on in school. Kids get false positives. They're out of school for a period of time. They're mask wearing, lockdowns, pressure to get a vaccine. We're treating those vax differently. You know what it's creating? It's doubled the number of drug and alcohol induced deaths in children. The mask mandates have caused a 350% surge in speech delays, a 30 to 50% increase in anxiety and depression. Counselors and psychologists are booked. The vaccine does not prevent infections or the spread of COVID or we wouldn't keep getting shots one after another. We're putting fear into our kids. In Scotland and Germany, the case ratio is the lowest in unvaxxed as those that are in, that have the double jab are seeing the most rise in hospitalizations. Myocarditis is one in every 2,000 kids that get it. It's irreversible. It's inflammation and damage to the heart. The, uh, book or the, the paper Gynecology and Obstetrics published a vaccine significant increase in menstrual cycle length. They're, sure, they're not sure what it means for the short term or for the long term. Medical decisions are based on clear risk ratio. There is zero benefit in children for this vaccine and all risk. States with no mask mandate are not showing an additional infection rate compared to those states that have a mask mandate. I ask you to look at the round table that uh, was on the other day where Senator Ron Johnson was talking to a group of doctors and look at the numbers. There was a 300% increase in the number of miscarriages that somebody reported from the DOD, a whistleblower, a 300% increase in cancer. 71% of the cases were people that were fully vaxxed. I have a letter here that talks about the VAERS report. And while the secondary inoculations, distributors of these vaccines are not Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair Pastor, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for your time this evening. And Allen, special educator in mathematics in Baltimore County. Recently, while my spouse and I were performing our morning ritual of antigen tests over coffee, waiting for our strips to display one line or two, we heard some news. I'm having difficulty reconciling messages that I'm hearing at the state and local levels, and I'm trusting you, Dr. Williams, fellow mathematician, to be able to understand data and the stories that data tell. Although we celebrate that the function new cases is falling with a steep negative slope, this has to be tempered by the fact that we are at about five times the threshold of the CDC's frightening highest threshold. We are still on fire. We can guess where we are going by talking about the slope, but we can't measure where we are from the slope. The only thing that measures where we are is where we are. Please don't let down our guard by setting inappropriate off ramps that contribute to spread. I agree with the theory that vaccination should reduce infection rates, but the ultimate measure of infection rates is infection rates. We can't let our guard down until the actual rate of infection is in the green zone. In Baltimore County, when we're down to 10 new cases per day, then we can start to think that we're coming out of this. We're not there right now. At least we're no longer at such a degree of infection that the daily case counts can only be reported with figures that are rounded to the nearest 100 cases. Let's not pursue risky strategies and just go for two because we want to be done uh, through sheer force of will. Sometimes when you take risks and go for two, there are catastrophic outcomes. With COVID, the stakes are high. However, we have great special teams. 
slow down, use all of our tools, continue to up our mass game, and we'll make it through in overtime. I'm especially confused to hear the State Board give clear metrics for letting up, while the metrics for using tools such as virtual schooling are opaque. Please be straightforward. When decision-making metrics are not clearly defined, there is an appearance that decision-making is arbitrary, and folks find patterns in decisions whether those patterns are real or not. Schools aren't the first thing to physically open and the last thing to physically close. Hospitals are, as underlined by the recent gubernatorial executive order. We're also not warehouses. We exist to create future opportunity for children, youth, and society. I recognize that you're in a tough spot. This is an unenviable Kobayashi Maru moment for leaders, and as such requires extremely creative solutions. I look forward to that day in May, June, that Baltimore County has 10 cases per day, which will be a small enough number that we would be able to use tools like pooled testing to identify the pockets of smoldering embers and then have manageable contact tracing to keep those embers from starting a new blaze. Use our tools, up our mass game, and continue to report data until the pandemic has actually been put out. Bless you. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Jean Milstein. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Williams and members of the board, my name is Jean, Jenny Milstein, and I am a paraeducator in a comprehensive high school. I want to talk to you tonight about staffing. I know you've heard it over and over again. We do have a severe staffing shortage, but it is not just teachers that we're short of. I am a paraeducator, and I work in a variety of classroom settings. Each of those settings has its unique set of challenges. However, some of the most challenging situations I found myself in this year are the classes of 30 plus students of all levels and abilities. These classes, art, physical education, and engineering, to name a few, are graduation requirements. Oftentimes in these environments, I find myself clarifying a concept to a student who needs help with calculation, at the same time as making sure that the student with sensory issues takes a break before melting down, while simultaneously attempting to listen to the teacher for next step directions. If that sounds like it's impossible, it kind of is. Additional adult assistants are staff members who work either one-on-one -on -one or in very small groups with students with higher support needs. These individuals are vital to the functioning of our schools. However, they are contractual employees who currently make minimum wage. Their jobs are challenging and, in the current climate of the pandemic, especially dangerous, considering they, one, work very closely with students, and two, do not have health insurance. Many positions remain unfilled, which means that paraeducators, teachers, and other staff members have to pick up the slack. I am encouraged to see that the fiscal year 2023 budget proposes an increase in the hourly rate for AAs to $14 an hour starting in July. While this is absolutely a step in the right direction, I am afraid that it might not be enough. Until they either become part of the paraeducator pool or get benefits through some other process, we will never be able to recruit or retain enough staff in this area. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is public comment on board policy 7330, and we have no speakers on that item. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Bruce Hades. Good evening, Ms. Hen. Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you. We, we do need to approve the action. Do we need to approve the action? Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's update on COVID-19, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. I'm going to request uh, Dr. Zarchin and Ms. Somerville to please report to the table. Good evening, Board Chair Hen, Vice Chair Pastor, and members of the Board of Education. I am pleased to present a brief COVID update to the board and team BCPS. 
My team and I will regularly update the board, our community, and Team BCBS during this time of change, and our partnership is critical to ensuring high-quality services to the students, staff, and families of Baltimore County. I think there is a slide. Thank you. Next slide, please. As a system, we continue with our efforts to recover, rebuild, and heal. While there continues to be signs that this year presents unprecedented challenges, our ongoing partnership remains vital to achieving our system goals. To that end, the public will find a virtual, um, sorry. This plan uh, presented tonight is simply an update. Um, tonight, we are pleased to provide Team BCPS an update on our responses to COVID-19. And with that, we have Ms. Deb Somerville, Director of Health Services, along with Dr. Michael Zarchin to provide a status report. Next slide, please. Ms. Somerville. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to give you good news. In the week that ended last Friday, January 21st, we saw a 60% reduction in reported cases in both students and employees. What we saw countywide is very similar. Our overall seven-day case rate has dropped from a high of 1,500 cases per 100,000 residents to, that was on January 9th, to 470 cases per 100,000 residents. The rate is dropping at about 40 to 50% each week. If we continue to drop cases at this rate, we are likely to be at the 100 threshold, which is CDC's transition from high to substantial by early, by mid-February probably. And we could be at moderate transmission levels, which is below 50 by the end of February. There are no guarantees that rates will continue to drop this quickly, but we have good reason to be hopeful that by spring, we will see substantially fewer cases of COVID. Next slide, please. You've heard Dr. Zarchin, Dr. Williams, and me say many times that we must and can safely preserve in-person learning. And to pick up on our previous uh, speaker said, we must continue mitigation. Our website has been updated to, um, with resources to support safe operation. We've added a calendar to help folks understand the return timelines with the new quarantine and isolation um, guidelines. We are continuing to expand testing resources, both PCR tests for our students at the secondary level and home test kits for all of our employees and students. Our KN95 mask delivery ex is expected to arrive this week for supplemental masks and logistics is ready to deliver those to schools upon, upon receipt. Our team continues to, to have uh, central office staff deployed to schools to prioritize in-person learning. Next slide, please. The final slide shows how the dropping rates in staff deployment is working to result in decreased numbers of, of uh, schools and programs needing to operate virtually. It's good news. Next slide, question. So we will continue to update the board and our community and team BCPS during these times. And so we were asked to give an update and this concludes our update at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any, are you taking any questions at this time? Dr. Williams? <laughs> Quick questions. Briefly. I just want to thank the board members for emailing us questions or reaching out to Dr. Zarcher and Ms. Somerville. So I don't have any questions, but I'll turn it back over to you, to Ms. Chair Ken. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? I just want to say to the two of you and all of our BCPS staff and all of our nurses, thank you, truly. Um, that You get beat up a lot in the community for trying to do the best job you can. And I appreciate that no matter what happens, you just keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I had a few questions. I emailed them, but Sorry. I just wanted to go okay. ahead. Yeah. I'll just, should I hold them? Well, we, we aren't scheduled for a full discussion, but if you have a quick comment or yes. question. Okay. So the first one is, um, 
have we been able to distribute the, the testing, the at-home tests to the elementary school students who weren't able to pick them up on the two asynchronous days? So have they been handed out to all elementary school students? They've been made available to all elementary students, yes. They did not go home in backpacks. So okay. parents needed to come up to schools, and if parents have not done that, they can make those arrangements with their principals to get their test kits. Okay. And I know there was a delay in the mass distribution of K95 masks. My younger siblings, they, they were not able to get theirs in, at their elementary school. I heard that we would be getting supplemental masks. You, you mentioned the presentation. So for those schools that have yet to receive the masks, are they getting these supplemental masks, or are, there, are the 126,000 masks that we previously had, are some of them still being distributed to students? Yes, to both. Okay. So, so the initial pediatric KN95s from the 126 are still on order. We had a second order. That second order is arriving in shipments for the pediatric masks. We are hopeful that those should be in the warehouse this week. Again, it's shipping, tracking shipping is a ch <laughs> I understand. Amazon yeah. has it down. I understand. Thank you. Um, and my last question real quickly is, so I know that in Montgomery County Public Schools, they started to do delivering bi-weekly tests, uh, bi-weekly masks to students um, once every two weeks is, is what I've heard. Um, and I'm wondering, is that something that we're able to consider or is that not feasible? So the plan for the KN95s, part of it is because of the, the bulk of the yeah. order, is to give five masks out to all secondary students and staff upon arrival of the order. So when it comes to school, we, the directions to principals will be to give five out. How a student or staff member chooses to use it, I wouldn't say five at once, but. Okay, that's incredible news. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Thank and thank you. you so much for everything you're doing. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. And thank you, board members. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Williams. I do want to put a plug for our health officials as well as our partners. We don't make these decisions in isolation, so we work collaboratively with Dr. Branch and the Baltimore County Health Department, as well as our partners at the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on academic achievement, map results for the fall administration. And for that, I call on Dr. Wheatley Phillip. And team. Yes, so this evening we will provide an overview of our fall map or measures of academic progress assessment results. So joining us are the following members of Team BCPS. Mr. Scott Conway, the proud principal of Owings Mills Elementary School. Uh, Dr. Heidi Miller, Executive Director of School Support and Achievement. Mr. Kevin Connolly, Executive Director of Performance Management Assessment. Dr. Eric Minus, the Executive Director, Research and Data Analytics, as well as Dr. Wheatley Phillips, the Chief Academic Officer. The purpose of this presentation is to report reading and mathematics baseline data for students in grades one through eight as we fully engage in face-to-face -face learning. Families who elected to participate in our virtual learning programs were provided with the opportunity to participate in the fall map assessment. <clears throat> All students who participated in the fall map assessment received a home report detailing their performance levels in reading and math. The fall map assessments are just one data point that will be used in conjunction, excuse me, with other assessments of our academic growth and achievement. They provide us with important insight in the current levels of student performance and acceleration needed for students to demonstrate skills which meet or exceed the expectations of college and career readiness grade level standards. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The Compass Our Pathway to Excellence provides a system-wide focus on raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing students for the future. Our dedication to ensuring our students graduate college and career ready is a thoughtful and research-based approach to understanding key metrics of student progress <coughs> along their trajectory of learning across school levels. BCPS utilizes map assessments in reading and mathematics as one measure of student achievement and growth along the college and career success pathway. 
As we collaboratively developed the compass, research showed that students who scored at or above the 61st percentile on map assessments were more likely to score a proficiency level of four or five on the corresponding MCAP assessments in ELA and mathematics. This is just one example of how the compass intentionally raises the bar for all students to promote college and career readiness. Next slide, please. Due to the impact of COVID-19, the COVID-19 global pandemic, MAP testing was not administered from the spring of 2020 through the spring of 2021. Testing resumed this fall with the administration of the MAP assessments in math and reading for students in grades one through eight. The MAP assessments allow us to compare our students' performance with that of their national peers. In addition to measuring student achievement, MAP assessment from one point in time to the next provide our parents and other BCPS internal stakeholders with important norm reference information about student growth in reading and math. Growth measures will help to inform the quality of implementation of our curriculum and instructional practices as a part of the key initiatives for focus area one, learning accountability and results, as well as the academic impact of our priority to accelerate student learning. On the next slides, Mr. Connolly will discuss the MAP data in addition to curriculum and instructional highlights, parent reports, and the assessment landscape. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Wheatley Phillip. To support our partnership with parents and care providers, every student who participates in MAP testing receives a home report. The home report provides parents and care providers with information about their child's reading and math performance student score, growth target, percentile rank, Lexile range for reading, and district and national mean scores for comparison. Additionally, parents and care providers receive information for each of the goal areas for reading and mathematics, which describes students' performance on a given set of skills as low, low average, average, high average, or high. Goal areas are based on the grade bands of the map assessment given. Goal areas for reading may include foundational skills, language and writing, literature, informational text, and vocabulary use and acquisition. Goal areas for math include operations and algebraic thinking, numbers and operations, measurement and data, the real and complex number systems, geometry, and statistics and probability. Next slide, please. Thank you. The Compass establishes three, five, and eight year targets and goals for winter map performance for students in kindergarten and grade two based on the 2019-2020 baseline year. The targets and goals are set on the percent of students achieving at or above the 61st percentile, which represents performance at a high average to high level. A percentile rank compares the performance of a student with the performance of all students who take the same assessment. The display graphs show the performance of students in grades one through five from the fall of 2019 compared to 2021. The five-year target established expectations that at least 50% of students will be performing at or above the 61st percentile by 2024, 2025, and that is represented by the y-axis. Due to the global pandemic, the last MAP assessments were given in the winter of 2020. In February of 2020, NWEA, the testing vendor for MAP, provided a technical brief on the findings of their research team. The NWEA research team recommended that moving forward, grade two students participate in a more rigorous version of the MAP assessment, which is aligned to the expectations for student growth over the course of the second grade school year. This shift in the assessment given to grade two students, which no longer is read aloud to them, resulted in a decrease in grade two performance in reading and math. We will evaluate the impact of this change on the grade two targets and goals following the, WAP, the winter MAP administration. In December of 2021, NWEA's research team reported national trends in student achievement based on the fall 2021 MAP assessments. Overall, 
national student achievement was lower for the fall MAP 2021 assessment compared to previous years with relative declines of 9 to 11 percentile points in math and 3 to 7 percentile points in reading. For BCPS, the fall 2021 MAP assessments indicated that students in grades 1, 3, 4, and 5 demonstrated an increase in the percentage of students performing at or above the 61st percentile compared to the performance of their peer groups for the 2019 pre-pandemic fall map assessments. When analyzing student performance, it is important to note that the norms were set prior to the COVID-19 global pandemic. The growth demonstrated in elementary fall map and reading from 2019 to 2021 indicates that student achievement has increased despite the learning interruptions created by the COVID-19 global pandemic for first, third, fourth, and fifth grade students. Home and school partnerships were critical to student academic growth, supported by the implementation of system-wide initiatives such as open court, comprehension of expository text, accelerated pathways for learning, number quarter, and bridges. Next slide, please. Thank you. As we move towards looking at middle school data, as previously stated, the testing vendors research team reported that across the nation, student achievement was lower for the fall map 2021 assessment than in previous years. The display graph showed the performance of students in grades six through eight from the fall of 2019 compared to 2021. For BCPS middle school students, the fall 2021 MAP assessment results show that a similar percentage of students performed at or above the 61st percentile compared to their peer groups in 2019 for grade 6 math and reading, as well as grade 7 reading. Yet compared to the 2019 peer groups, students in grade 7 demonstrated a decrease in performance for math, while students in grade 8 had a decreased performance in both math and reading. Middle school teachers and staff, working with school administrators and curriculum specialists, implement specific strategies to increase disciplinary literacy, working on best practices in teaching and learning, and using instructional approach to support students such as Elevation and AVID. Illustrative Math, a new initiative for the school year, is designed to further enhance student growth and achievement in mathematics. We know that there is much work to be done across grade levels to accelerate student learning, to meet and exceed our high expectations for student performance. Our commitment to rigorous three, five, and eight year targets and goals for students across grade levels serves as evidence of our beliefs and actions to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare students for the future. We thank you parents and care providers for helping your child with their school with their schoolwork, supporting student participation, an extended day, and extended year learning opportunities, and serving as powerful partners to support student learning. Together with school staff, this critical partnership supports the instructional growth and social emotional well being of our students. Next slide, please. Thank you. MSCE has resumed normal administration times for all state assessments. In addition to these assessments, Team BCPS uses a variety of assessments, such as teacher-created and curriculum-based, or CBAs, to monitor student learning and adjust instruction to meet the needs of students. Standards-based assessments are administered to students in grades K through 12 across all content areas and at regular intervals. Growth and achievement over time is measured by assessments such as BAP, PSAT, SAT, and AP. Career and technical education certification exams further evaluate student mastery of specific skills based on benchmarks or industry standards. This evening, we highlighted the results of the fall MAP assessments. The winter MAP testing for students in kindergarten through grade eight begins on February 14th 2022. The results allow us to compare student growth from the fall to the winter and student performance of peer groups across the nation to our students, while informing teachers about instructional pathways to accelerate and enhance student learning. 
In the spring, we will provide an update on student growth and achievement based on the winter map reading and math assessment results, the use of map data at the system level and in schools to inform instruction and measure progress, as well as how map data supports our partnership with parents and care providers to inform student growth. On the next slide, Dr. Miller will discuss how focus area one is operationalized at the system level through the division of school support and achievement. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. <clears throat> From the system level, as executive directors of school support and achievement, we support principals in using MAP as one of multiple data points to support teaching and learning. As shown in the previous slide that reviewed the assessment landscape, schools administer curriculum-based assessment, teacher-created assessments, and provide checks for understanding during the classroom lessons to determine the strengths and needs of students. As you know, every school has developed their school progress plan to create a roadmap for improvement. Elementary and middle schools use MAP as one data point to guide the development of the school progress plan and to develop action steps from the BCPS teaching and learning framework. Professional development for staff is then planned to build the capacity and skill set of teachers. In addition, MAP data is used to design interventions and supports for students who are not making expected progress, as well as providing access to advanced accelerated learning for students that are doing well. And finally, effective use of resource staff is key. School leaders create instructional schedules using student data such as MAP to ensure the needs of students are being met. Our principals are working very, very hard to support their schools during this very challenging time. Please join me this evening in welcoming Principal Scott Conway, our principal representative who has worked tirelessly to support students, families, staff at Owings Mills Elementary. Mr. Conway will describe how he leads his school team at Owings Mills Elementary to use MAP as one data point and how systems and structures are in place at Owings Mills to ensure that all students are making progress. On the next slide, Mr. Conway will explain how learning, accountability, and results occur at the school-based level. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Williams, board members, and all BCPS leadership for your continued support, especially in this challenging time. Um, Click to the next slide. Sorry there. Um, I would like to start by sharing some demographics for our school. The current enrollment is 747 students. We are one of the largest Title I elementary schools in BCPS. Our diverse and amazing students are represented by approximately 35% Hispanic, 60% African American, and 5% varying student groups. About 30% of our entire school population receives ESOL services at this time. So some about MAP. Students in grades one through five take the MAP in the fall. Students in grades K through five take the MAP in the winter. And then finally, students in Ks one, or in grades K, one, and two take the MAP assessment in the spring. The MAP assessment for math is administered in one day online. This is also the same for reading. As Dr. Miller indicated, MAP is one data point in conjunction with in-class data, Dibbles, reading and math curriculum-based assessments, and Fontas and Pinnell, which determines reading levels for students. And then we use that to support our students, that data. We are especially proud of the teamwork that exists in our school. We have systems and structures in place to look at student data and determine interventions, acceleration, and advancement. Our instructional leadership team meets on a weekly basis to look at student data across all grade levels. Members of this team include the administration, 
the reading and math resource teacher, the staff development teacher, a special educator, and the school counselor. Grade levels meet with the ILT two times per month to discuss next steps in supporting students and reviewing school schedules. We use map data during this time to look at where students are performing in their Lexile level, which allows us then to make decisions about reading. MAP has helped us to identify students not making progress, especially in reading, with, with the MAP results. As a result, our reading specialist and staff development teacher have designed an intervention program in reading that we call Literacy Support Program. Students were selected for this daily intervention based on performance on MAP, class performance, and also on Dibbles. We currently have almost 50 students in grades one through three who participate in this daily intervention that focuses on reading fluency, comprehension, vocabulary, and writing. 100% of students have made growth in their reading level, and we are thrilled about this. I invite any of the board members to come and see this program in action. On the next slides, Dr. Minus will discuss the system resources that are available to support the use of data to inform our decision making. Great, thank you, Mr. Conway, and thank you for the work that you and your team are doing on behalf of the students that we serve. Good evening, everyone. As part of Dr. Williams and Team BCPS's commitment to transparency, the school profile dashboard has been publicly available to all stakeholders since March 2019 through our bcps.org site. The school profile dashboard, which is updated annually, provides a wealth of information about our schools, including academic achievement, climate, and demographic data, as well as more operational information, such as operating budget, building utilization, and the number of teachers. Parents and other community stakeholders are encouraged to access the BCPS public dashboards as it is an outstanding resource in providing a high level view of multiple system data points and accompanying information. As a complement to the highlights tab, there are three additional tabs that provide additional academic achievement data, including MAP for elementary and middle schools, the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, or MCAP, for elementary, middle, and high schools, as well as PSAT and SAT data for high schools. We look forward in the very near future to providing additional upgrades to support parents and other community stakeholders in navigating these robust resources. The school profile dashboard is available along with the COVID facilities management, compass, and stakeholder survey public dashboards through our bcps.org site. Next slide, please. Thank you. The MAP fall data shared today in our presentation and the data report provides us with valuable baseline data as we work to heal, recover, and rebuild. We will examine and share the additional fall data points to support our understanding of current levels of student performance in relation to standards-based achievement from the Maryland Early Fall Assessments and Readiness Standards for kindergarten students. We will also have winter and spring MAP administrations to provide additional data on student growth and achievement. The assessment results will support our understanding of priorities for student learning, growth of students over time, and areas in need of continued acceleration. Throughout the 2021-2022 school year, Team BCPS will continue to provide regular updates on how our students are progressing. Some of these upcoming reports include college and career readiness, advanced placement, and course grades, to name a few. These reports are available on the BCPS key reports on our, uh, on our website, and new reports will be uploaded throughout the year as data become available and shared. Next slide, please. And finally, the attached slide just displays a timeline of the academic achievement report scheduled to be presented to the board and public throughout this school year. And we thank you for your time 
and engagement this evening. Yeah. Thank you very much, <laughs> board members. At this point, I'll open it up to questions, comments, discussion. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation on a uh, map. Um, so I only have one question, and that was about the uh, second grade math um, reading and, and reading reading and math levels. Uh, those were the only consistent. Second grade was like the consistent uh, decline in all the, the areas, and everywhere else had at least one increase. Do we know what specifically about second grade? You know, what, any ideas as to why that would have such a decrease in every category? Yeah. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, prior to uh, the fall administration of the 2021 map assessments, second graders took the K through second grade map test, mm. and that um, the items were read to students. When uh, NWEA did some research um, based on um, knowing that they were renorming mm -hmm. and looking back at about seven years worth of data, they had recognized that the typical second grader mm -hmm. needed to be on a different scale to properly show growth over the course of the year. Right. So when we moved students based on the recommendations from one assessment to another, um, about 84% of our students, you know, we expected to be in that range, mm -hmm. and and we expect about 16% of our students not to be. It's just a, a statistic that they're that they're in a growth trajectory. Um, that is why we saw a dip. And if you look at second grade data sure. overall, you can see that where they actually performed is more aligned with where everyone else was performing versus being um, an outlier, which is what they had been previously. Okay, thank you, that, that makes a lot of sense. I've heard of that before, but I, I didn't remember. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Hager, Ms. Mack, and then Ms. Pester. trying to un unmute my computer. That's not gonna help me. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for that presentation. I really appreciate how much work goes into preparing these data reports so quickly. And I know that um, you probably have all kinds of analyses you want to do that you just had to pull together some histograms. So I appreciate that. Um, as a parent, I really like map tests to see them come home and to see the growth. And um, I, I personally am a big fan of the, of the map test and I am cautiously optimistic about the results that you sh shared today. I know it's only one data point, but I know I, among probably others, anticipated seeing a, perhaps a decline or at least more um, stable trends. And so I am very excited about the presentation that you had. Um, a few things that I know I would like to see in the future, perhaps. Um, the way that I know we have a, a report as well on board docs, I don't know if that's been made public, that also outlines um, data by race, English language learner, farms, and things like that. Um, but without knowing that that change, the 2019 to, to 21 change is not that helpful. So just seeing that there are disparities still is less helpful to me than to see if the disparities were um, enhanced due to the pandemic, if that makes sense. So. Um, that would be my, my pr preference in the next data report if you're able to pull that together. Um, two quick questions. One is, were the numbers of students that took this test similar? I know that we had a, had a decline in enrollment, but generally similar in the fall. Were there yeah. any reasons that students didn't take it or anything? So uh, Appendix A lists the um, student participation, and we're hovering between 7,800 students and 8,100 students, which uh, mirrors okay. your typical assessments that we provide for math. Okay, good. I was curious. I saw that, but I didn't have again the reference, so I didn't know what I was comparing it to. So thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and then I saw the that we had set our um, our goals for grades two, five, and eight, which I thought was really interesting, given the grade two test issue. So we're never really going to know if we've how we've done with two. Um, fifth grade looked pretty on par, and then eighth grade is is the one right that really stands out as an area where we've declined. And having an eighth grader, they're the ones who didn't get. You know, they missed like most of middle school because of the pandemic. They really were affected. Have you guys thought more about the eighth grade scores and have any thoughts on kind of so specific let, intervention? Let me respond. When we developed those benchmarks, second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, that was pre-pandemic. So we were looking at those transitional years, the transitional years in elementary and then transitional year before they get to middle school in eighth grade, uh, before they get to ninth grade in high school. And so I, so these are the conversations i just love these questions because these are the questions that we raise you are really demonstrating the work that happens in every school to really drill down and ask the questions and so i just want to reference why we singled out second grade fifth grade and eighth grade those were a part of our compass pre-pandemic 
and then the question, and thank you, um, Mr. Conley, Conley because uh, that question is what we were asking about second grade and what we may have to re revisit because of the change uh, from NWA. But anything else um, from the team wants to add? Uh, as far as the eighth grade data piece, yeah, you, <clears throat> when we compared our data, and we had these discussions as well internally be before bringing it to you, to the NWEA in December 2021, they produced their results nationally. Um, we were pleasantly surprised, not only did we have some growth when they were showing um, loss, you know, across the nation. Even our areas where we had a, a dip due to instructional interruptions wasn't as significant as their average. Um, one of the things to take a look at in the very beginning of the report are the actual RIT scores. Our RIT scores are slightly below national norms. So what that really means is that while we didn't fall as significantly, you know, we fall marginally or even made growth, you know, that shows us that we're, we're on a trajectory to accelerate. And that's the big piece in all of this, is that we have by 2024, 2025, the opportunity to have 50% or more of our kids as our target, our goal, at or above the 61st percentile. That's shifting a bell curve, and that's gonna require a lot of work. Um, I'm really excited to get to the winter piece so we can see where it's really working. And the initiatives that we put in place, some were started last year at the elementary level and middle school, and some were brought in this year. And so the, the curricular impact of our collective efforts um, hopefully will be demonstrated as we're looking forward to that winter data. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Thank you. Thank you very much for this information. And I'd like to publicly thank our schoolhouse staff, our advocates who pushed for evidence-based curriculum for many years, and for the CNI staff for implementing things like open court bridges, et cetera. My first question is just a format question. Is there any relevance to the Y axis going to 50 and not to 100? Yes, uh, that is the goal that we set for the 2024, 2025 school year, that we would have 50% of our kids, because we're not talking about 100% being above the 61st percentile. 100% is represented by a bell curve. So what we're looking at is what the goal target is in reference to actual performance. Okay, thank you. And then you mentioned, and Mr. Thomas asked for clarification, that this was the first time that second graders were not allowed to have a reader for the fall administration of MAP. Um, and we're, we think that that is contributing to the decline in the scores. To ensure that we have an apples to apples comparison, will the second graders taking both the winter MAP and that same cohort of second graders taking the spring MAP also not have a reader? So the for readers, yeah, the platform have it read to them rather. Correct. The platform itself doesn't have reading for all students. Students that receive that as an accommodation absolutely have a reader provided to them. So we're talking about the majority of kids taking the assessment. Um, prior to this fall assessment, we didn't have baseline data as a reference due to the global pandemic from first grade. So the way that the research works with NWEA is that RIT score really drives where a student goes next. So if a student is performing below a 170, which is the beginning of first grade, they would actually go back to the K-2 to two assessment, where students who are um, above that level are, are on the range of second grade learning, they would be staying with their two to five. So the majority of kids, about 88% of our kids, we would anticipate based on data from 1920, would continue on this trajectory of the two to five assessment. And that'll be provided to all schools through our uh, winter training. So just to be clear, the cohort of kids who took this fall 2021 will take it the same exact way for both winter and spring? Yes, the, the vast majority of kids. Okay, and Correct. then do third graders, uh, unless they have a specific accommodation, um, do they take MAP independently? Yes, they, they're part of that two to five MAP assessment group. It was just the second graders where that's there was overlap, right. and that's where the research came in to let us know that the majority of kids really should be in the two to five to show growth over the course of the year that's commensurate with their skill level. And then you mentioned, you, you, your statement was, when compared to students who take the same assessment. But then on one of the slides, it says, child-specific student test is tailored to individual student. Sure, so there's a bank of items that second graders, let's say, would take, since we're talking about second graders. 
a entry level item is designed to be adaptive. So it's going to say, okay, this is what you're doing in math for operations. You know, you're able to solve this problem. Depending on how a student does, it'll make it more difficult or it'll make it less difficult. And math typically has 47 to 53 test items that the goal is to get the kids right in the middle, okay. half right, half wrong. And that's how it's adaptive. So the kids do start on the same pathway, but then the tests adjust to them based on what they get correct and what they don't get correct. Okay, that's very helpful and thank you. And I'd like to, um, Dr. Hager said that as a parent, she likes math. I, I have often hear teachers say of every assessment that they give students, they find math to be the most helpful. And I really appreciate this information, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Pester? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for this presentation and the way it's laid out. I want to address my question or comment or whatever both to Dr. Williams. Um, as you navigate your way through the compass, because all of this is attached to the compass, and you're looking at the efficiency report, I think that the information we were given tonight goes to this thinking in my head, that sometimes we say more is not necessarily better, but I'm now saying not only is more better, but it's critical. So with the questions that were asked, in order to make sure that we have um, equity school by school, because all of this is going to be looked at by schools, every school, it is imperative that we not reduce um, the executive directors for um, uh, middle school and high school. I'm suggesting even looking at separate ones and not a lump, if possible. In order to move all of our, our administrators, our people in our schoolhouses to help move our children, there needs to be that consistent language coming from uh, those central office people with whom they will be working. Because clearly, some of the discrepancies we're seeing goes back to that. The kind of support that each school is getting um, must be, on one hand, the same, but with people from central office understanding those little quirks and differences by school, by the nature of the students in the school, um, what the numbers look like. So as we're, you're plowing through your organization and the budget, it's not enough just for us to be sitting here and looking at numbers and hearing the explanations, which are beautifully done. But now, how do we take this information and move forward in supporting all of our principals because everyone is not at the same place, not every administrator is at the same place or as gifted. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Um, the map scores that you sent home, it's something that I also look forward to, and most parents look at these map scores. Are the math scores sent in languages other than English to parents? And my second question is, you talked about the intervention that um, you have a team, I believe the instructional leadership team, that looks into the data for um, kids that are, um, I guess, falling behind. Uh, could you explain that in a little bit detail? How does curriculum instruction, your office, and the school's team coordinate for those students that don't have parents advocating for them. Well, okay. Mr. Conway, why don't you address well, that? I can directly talk to you about it on the school level. So obviously curriculum and instruction helps us with, they design the curriculum for us to utilize with the kids. But as far as MAP, I have access to those scores directly. The DRAA office, as they went through, has all that available to us, but I can actually use the website to go in. There are several ways that I use the data. Um, I explained to you about the intervention program. Um, our team is made up of instructional leaders within the school, so I have my own team. I have different members from each one, so I have my assistant principals. I have my um, staff development teacher, who's a leader in the school. I have reading resource teachers that include my reading specialists math resource teachers, 
and a special educator, and we all, we, we take the scores and look at it as a whole. So when I use MAP, I can look at it by the school, what, what area am I lacking that I need to provide professional development for my teachers? Do I need one for a specific grade level? Do I need one for the school as a whole? Then I can look by class with teacher. Is there a teacher that just needs professional development provided only to her or him? And then I can look at individual students and see that's where we look at the students and I use that as one section. So we use the Lexile scores, which kind of gives us in range with classroom performance, classroom assessments, where are students reading, who's really reading below the standard that we want. And then we look at that to form groups of students that you know, who needs intensive support, who needs some supports that maybe we can provide where we can just, they're just barely off the grade level with an extra push they'd be on. It also gives me a look at students that are performing above the grade level. And are they, there's, there's different reports in there that show me, do I have a student that is high, but they're not showing growth? So they're already at an academic achievement level that's above. Am I not doing the right thing in my school that I can push them forward? So there's a, there's a lot of various different things and what, ways that we can utilize it. Now, it's only one piece, so you gotta couple that together with a lot of other things, and you have to have open discussions, and you have to have those discussions in terms of each individual student, but we've been able to put together the intervention programs based on reading, and it's our kids that are you know, not quite there, but just there. And then we use programs provided by the county, Dr. Williams, things like that, to then put together and, and really try to move them along quicker. And, and you, like I said, anybody can come and see the program in action, how we split it up, what we do. We attack various reading um, necessities for, to, to create good readers. And I'd like to add on to Mr. Conway's comments, the um, principals, the, what, one of the most important things is that every classroom has effective teaching, like effective first instruction. So if, if our teachers are in teaching to their highest level, that will translate into, you know, higher test scores altogether, but the students are learning. So again, you know, reiterating, it's one, it's one data point that we look at, but principals also, you know, use the teaching and learning framework created by curriculum and instruction and all of us on the um, ED support team to guide instruction and to look at those best practices and make sure they're happening in the classroom. And so I would also add just from the research and data analytics side where we are in, in DRAA, this is where the collaboration I think is very powerful among central office colleagues as well because as we get the data, as we look at the data, you have people within these offices who have also been in schools, they've been principals, and so it helps us to be able to identify blind spots that others may not be seeing, and we begin to bring it to our colleagues so we have different structures in place within our central office that allow us to have these conversations, whether it's the cross-divisional ED meetings, the other um, uh, ATM meetings, uh, various meetings that allow us to bring some um, data uh, to the table that will help us answer or ask some provocative questions around how we're gonna reach some of our students. So I think that's the, the beauty of the collaboration amongst the central offices that then trickle down into the schools as well. Thank you for answering that. that. That was well answered. Thank you so much. And you keep talking about inviting board members to come visit what, what you do. Where could we come and see how you're doing this great collaboration? Owings Mills Elementary School. <laughs> right on Risertown Road, you'll see me in the morning waving cars in. Come on All in. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you um, for this presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I had a quick question. What method of assessment is uh, the MAP given in um, this year and then was it consistent with previous years? Yeah, so the, the assessment is consistent. The item bank um, is based on our Common Core State Standards. Uh, that came out, I believe, in 2015 when it was renormed. Um, 
prior to that, it was based on the voluntary state curriculum. So it is, you know, adjust to, you know, what our expectations are for teaching and learning. There's an alignment there, which is really nice. Students take um, an adaptive electronic assessment. Some kids may do it in 20 minutes. Other kids may do it in 50 minutes. Um, but so it's a self-paced type of assessment that doesn't time out for students. It does have some tools that students can use as well that they're used to using as part of their curriculum-based assessments as well as state assessments. So there's a lot of nice um, consistencies with MAP in comparison to assessments that kids would take in other platforms as well as MAP assessments from fall to winter to spring. So they're all, so both literacy and math are in the adaptive electronic That's version? Correct. Yes. So they're. The students are using them on the laptops they use yes. yeah. regularly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, a parent reported uh, that their BCPS elementary school twins, uh, that when they received their home report, that one uh, student was um, less than 10% and another student was over 90%. Um, how does that happen that uh, such um, divergent uh, test scores would be in the same grade? So every student is unique, and it's based on their responses in comparison to their peer group, as we talked about before. So while a student is still taking items to get to that 50% right, 50% wrong, the types of items that they're completing may be at a different level of instructional expectations than another student. And then because it's norm referenced, every student data point is plotted along a bell curve. So you have somebody who's at the 1% and somebody who's at the 99th percentile and everything in between. I would also say in, in, in for, for practitioners, right, and also as a, a speaking as a parent who has students who have kids that take the map, we're also looking at the variables that exist around where are the student, where's the student that day in terms of when, how they're showing up, right? And so we also know that test and assessment fatigue is real. We also know that our students show up differently on various days. And we also know that as, former, as, as a former principal, motivating our students every day to take certain assessments seriously also is part of that variable as well. And so I think all of those pieces kind of create, you know, that um, the true operationalizing of how this all works in a school. Um, and so I do think that that plays into where students end up when they um, access these different assessments during specific times of the year as well. Yeah, and part of that conversation that we'd have at a grade level meeting is to look at how long, how much time did the student take to take the test? Mm -hmm. Because if we see, as Dr. Minus mentions, that the student completed in 12 minutes, then their level of engagement may be very different than a student that took 40 minutes to complete the assessment. And, and like Dr. Minus said, I mean, the parent has relevant concerns they have twins but you know they're two different students and it's one we talked about this it's one data point so i'm not looking at map with my instructional leadership team and saying well automatically you have to take other data points into consideration also and then they're going to take the map assessment again coming in the winter and then you know some will take it in the spring so you get another look at it to see and you need to compare all that stuff Thank you for that. And uh, in 2016, the Gifted and Talented Citizens Advisory Council uh, has on their website where they're, we're reviewing policy 6401 about advanced academics. And they had uh, asked the question, or they explained first that the uh, elementary schools were going to heterogeneous groupings as opposed to more homogenous groupings, students of like achievement, like accomplishment. Mm -hmm. um, and the question that they asked is how do they know if that model is working for the students and how do we know if that model is working for the teachers to have potentially very differing degrees of ability or interest. Sometimes it's students that are not interested in the subject. Um, so uh, the question is, is where is the data to show whether that model is working best for our students and our teachers? So this type of anecdotal thing uh, gives me concern. So I'm just curious what your assessment is of that. So my response to that is that we are charging our principals and leadership teams to look at the data to make those decisions. Based on the data, we'll determine whether we are grouping our students appropriately, departmentalizing, all of those. That, that's the point of the leadership team coming together. 
coming together, as Mr. Conway said, he identified those individuals and really to make those informed decisions about the needs of, of the students. And so um, that that's my only response to, I'm not sure about the data in 2016, uh, a, lot, a lot has occurred since 2016, um, and I want to thank um, Dr. Boswell McComas and her team working with the GT committee and really looking at ways to improve that. So it's really a school by school. And, and, and again, we have had some conversations. These are good questions because these are the type of questions we ask at, at senior leadership. Um, level and definitely what's happening at the school side as well as the collaboration of the different offices, especially what's happening in our local schools, as Mr. Conwell said. So it's really a school to school, but we are asking those questions. What are the data points telling us and what might we do differently for our instructional model? So from what I'm hearing, there's flexibility for the schools to make decisions about grouping for students based on the effectiveness of instruction and achievement? There's that flexibility and there, there's guidance from our specialists, from the curriculum side, as well as the draw. I just want to circle back, if I may. Sure. Uh, Dr. Minus said this and Ms. Pasteur said this, that we have a model where we have our central office teams coming together and looking at data. There's one ve vehicle called the instructional core team, which I've shared many times that you had a principal to talk about that kind of support. The other model is through our system improvement team that was created two years ago, and we're looking at data. But it's also the importance, as you can see the pair right there, uh, Dr. Miller and her principal, Mr. Conway, they come together. They are, they are monthly reminders, maybe weekly reminders, about data points, and our principals use that to really drill down, and then those executive directors go into school, and they have those conversations. And so that collaboration is going to get us to move these data points at various levels to see a change in the system data, and it's all tied to the strategic plan. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you for this presentation. Um, I'm looking at the, the overall report, and there's a lot of data in there. Um, and there's a lot of variation um, from school to school. Uh, but what's important, uh, specifically Principal Conway, is what you have access to and what you can do with that data. Um, and do you have the people that you need to address the needs you're seeing in your school? Because you know, we can sit here and talk about data all night, and we will because we love data. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it comes down to are your children learning and what can we do if they're not? Uh, do you have what you need? I absolutely have my staff and I, and I find that to be school leadership to take the resources that I have available and make determinations for my school that puts people <clears throat> in the right place where I do have needs. And I, I find at my school, I can only speak for my school, I'm not in another, but I have been provided everything I need. As far as for MAP itself and what it provides for me, again, it's a small piece, but in the data there, it gives me access to look at kids that are struggling, kids that are also above the line and who are excelling. Our goal, right, is to accelerate everyone, so I need to take that data, couple it with others, and then use that data to put programs in place for them. So um, I, I guess my answer to you, yes, I am provided what I need, but I, I, it's still up to the school to make instructional decisions that benefit their kids. And every school is different. My school is not the same as a school that's even 10 miles down the road from me. Right. I, I, it's very clear looking at the data uh, that the schools are not the same. There's, like I said, there's a tremendous amount of variation across the system. And I'll, I don't know if everyone's looking at this report but I am in Appendix C, percentage of students scoring at or above the 61st percentile by school. Um, and it's, it's disheartening uh, to see <laughs> massive variation uh, like this, but I understand that it's the reality and it's just a piece of data, right? Yeah. So I'm not trying to like judge entire schools by this. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I'm hopeful that the tools that have been put into place 
are, are providing you, because these are like snapshots, like fall, spring, right? But you have things happening daily and weekly, and kids, you know, plateau, they jump up, they bounce around, and what have you. Um, but, I, you know, I, wanted, I want to know that overall your team is seeing the student for where they are and providing them with the tools that they need to grow. And if there are things that are missing, we're in the budget season, it's prime time, and I know we've th thrown a lot of money at, at more folks and what have you. Um, but, you know, the question is open, and hopefully everybody out there is engaged to say, here is something else that we might possibly need. Where can we focus? Uh, so, provide? so if I remind the board, based on a direction from you to survey every principal, we did just that. And the principals were able to prioritize just what they would like to see in the budget. And Mr. Kuhn, I guarantee all 176 principals are good advocates for their schools. And they would come back to the executive director and say, looking at my data, or the executive director may make some recommendations, to look at programming differently, scheduling different, differently, and looking at resources, and sometimes even requesting resources. Um, and so I, I just wanted, that, that's the work that that office does with the schools, they have those conversations, but um, our principals will be advocates for their own schools. And they also know sometimes they have to look at those other resources um, in terms of partnerships, collaborations with what's within their community, their PTA, their student leaders. And, and so I appreciate that. Um, that's what we chose Mr. Conway to come for. He's not afraid to advocate. Uh, for his schools, I guarantee the other principals as well. They, they see the need, they will ask the question. We will ask the question, what can we do differently? Um, and again, this is one data point amongst many. I appreciate you making that reference. Also, we wanna see, this is really data points for the teacher. MAP is really about the instructional model and strategy within the classroom. And so uh, we've, we have found that, we've heard today that how the leadership team will come together and talk about the work that is happening in the school level and then to talk with the staff about what might be done differently. So I appreciate your point about having the resources necessary for every school. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Bruschetti, does Ms. Mack have any more time? 20 seconds. 20 seconds, Ms. Mack? Do you want to use your Mr. Conley, I want to make Time. this quick. You mentioned Fontes and Pinnell, and there was a, a study that came out at the end of last year about the fact that it is not as effective as it was previously thought to believe, but it sounds like your strategy is built on Fontes and Pinnell, so could you touch base on that, please? It's more on, on classroom-based assessments than that. Um, it was just one of the things back in the time that we used, but it's more performance-based within class, looking at, le like I said, Lexile with MAP, where students are reading, taking that. I, I know there was a study with that, so that's not the only thing. I was just trying to compare some different things that have been used in the future, or in the past, I'm sorry, as data points for, for making decisions for the groupings we've had. Um, we just level kids. We do, use, we do use it for some. It's just one look at it for, for levels of where they are and compared to Lexile, also compared with classroom performance, so it's not, anything based we need as many different data points as we have to make the best decision for kids so thank you sure great thank you thank you all for the outstanding presentation appreciate your time thanks have a good evening have a good evening the next item on the agenda is consideration of the fy 2023 county capital budget request for that i call on mr saris and mr dixit Good evening. Good evening, Chair, Ms. Hen, Vice Chair, Ms. Pasture, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Uh, as you'll recall, on December 21st, 2021, we introduced the fiscal 2023 county capital plan to you. In the work session on January 11th, 2022, we answered questions and went into all the details of the plan. 
We have not received any further questions, so tonight we are here to request your approval of the plan so that we can move forward. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Board members, do I have a motion to approve the FY 2023 County Capital Budget Request as presented in Exhibit K-1? So moved, Roe. Thank you, Ms. Roe. May I have a second? Second, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mac. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. The next item on the agenda is an information item, including the financial report for November 2021. And that is located in board docs. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. Before we move to committee updates, the board would like to bring forth a resolution. May I have a motion to approve the following board resolution, 2022-04, on COVID-19, and I will go ahead and read this resolution. One moment. Okay. Resolution 2022-04 on COVID-19. Whereas Lawrence J. Hogan, Jr., governor of the state of Maryland, issued a declaration of state of emergency and existence of catastrophic health emergency, COVID-19 on March 5th, 2020, regarding the outbreak of disease caused by the novel coronavirus. And whereas the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has issued guidance to all states and local governments and all citizens recommending preparedness to prevent community spread and guard against COVID-19. And whereas the Board of Education of Baltimore County deems it essential to prepare for the possibility that due to medical or health emergencies related to COVID-19, individual board members may not be able to attend board meetings or board committee meetings, or the possibility that it may be necessary for the entire board or board committee to meet remotely or virtually in order to protect the health of the public or board members. And whereas the business of the board must continue even if medical or health emergencies related to COVID-19 arise, and whereas the board recognizes that the Maryland Open Meetings Act requires that the board hold its meetings in public unless otherwise permitted under the act, be it therefore resolved that notwithstanding any other policy of the board, limitations on the number of board meetings that an individual board member may attend remotely and the basis for participating remotely are suspended through June 30th, 2022, and be it further resolved that notwithstanding any other policy of the board, this resolution is retroactive to the start of the 2021-2022 school year, and be it further resolved that the superintendent is authorized to establish an appropriate technological mechanism that would allow board members individually or as a whole to fully participate in meetings remotely without being physically present, and which would allow the public to attend the meeting by being able to fully listen to those portions of the meeting that are open pursu pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act. So moved, Roe. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there any discussion? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. I'd just like to share that um, I will not be voting in favor of this. I think the board should be holding itself to the same standard that we are all BCPS students and staff that are currently in the building. So thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Next is committee updates, and we'll start with the audit committee. Mr. McMillian. Thank you. During our January 12, 2022 audit committee meeting, the committee went into administrative function section 
session to discuss the public works report on the Office of Internal Audit. Per the recommendation of the Audit Committee, at this time, I move that the board reject the recommendation of Public Works Efficiency Review to reduce the number of staff in the Office of Internal Audit. Okay. Is there a second? There is a second as required since it comes from committee. Any discussion? Would you like to speak to your motion, Mr. McDonald? Yes, very briefly. Considering that we're the 25th largest school system in the country, we've got uh, uh, over 175 schools, uh, over 108,000 students, over 18,000 employees. We're over a $2 billion budget annually, operating budget. Uh, we have federal money coming in. We have the blueprint, pending money coming in from the state. We need, in my opinion, we need to keep the staff that we have in turn audit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Joes? Thank you. Um, to echo what Mr. McMillian just said, having been on the audit committee, I do want to uh, especially thank the Office of Internal Audit. They do an incredible job, and they, they are uh, very critical to maintaining accountability and transparency in the school system. So I fully support this uh, resolution. So thank you to the Office of Internal Office and all of the staff that work so hard. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Um, was this a unanimous decision from the committee? Excuse me? Was this, was this a unanimous decision from the committee? Or was the vote like three in favor? Can you address your, okay. My you, motion is to, Mr. McMillian. My motion is to reject the efficiency review recommendation to lower the number of employees. And Mr. McMillian, Mr. Thomas would like to know if the committee's vote was unanimous. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pasture. Thank you. Uh, ditto on the things that have been said before Mr. McMillian pointed out blueprint. Um, we throw that in, um, but Mr. McMillian is correct. What the Office of uh, Internal Audit is doing and will do even more is to make sure that we are always in compliance. It's like having a mini um, um, board, the larger board that will come in and look at us. Their work is so critical. In fact, I would even push for them to have at least one more staff person, but certainly I will go with Mr. McMillian's that they maintain it, not make it smaller. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pester, Ms. Rowe? Yes, I would just like to um, concur with what other board members have said in support of this, but also to point out that um, the board members were emailed um, Ms. Andrew Barr's response to the efficiency review. And if you read that very closely, she did not get the opportunity to collaborate with the efficiency um, review, and she responded to every item that they presented and I think that the statements that she made were very compelling, and I believe she made her case and they didn't. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Dr. Hager? Sorry, I was just writing in the chat. Never mind, because I, I found the answer to my question, but I, I, I also support this. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? So I don't... Um, disapprove of this motion. Uh, my concern is I'm still trying to digest the information because it is a lot and very detailed. And I just asked for all of the correspondence to be provided and it was just re provided as everybody's aware of because I copied everyone on the email that I sent earlier today. So um, I can't fully support this. Unfortunately, at this moment in time, I have to take very seriously the uh, the work done by the efficiency group, um, not to say that they did a complete job, and I am actually very distressed to hear that they did not interact with our internal audit group and give them um, the ability to provide information that would be pertinent to what is needed. But it is a specific, a spe it is a tremendous amount of money we're talking about over four years. Um, uh, but, you know, it sounds as if you have the votes to pass your motion. 
um, but I was hoping to table it so that I could review the information and then vote with everybody, uh, possibly at the next meeting. But um, you can do what you want with your motion, but I can't support it at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And I'll also comment, I support the motion because the resources are absolutely critical. However, I agree with Public Works' recommendation that the um, work needs to be allocated toward projects that are going to show a return on that investment. And like Mr. Kuhn said, these are significant dollars. The board has requested projects that we, quite frankly, haven't had the resources in the Office of Internal Audit to work on. So I would ask that we, we look at those. And Mr. McMillian, I'd like to work with you to look at the prioritization of those projects. We certainly, I agree with what um, others have said, we need more resources, not less, in that office because there are certainly some very critical projects that this board has asked to undertake that we don't have hours or staff hours in that office to undertake that Public Works has recommended that they undertake. So while I agree that we need every resource we can get in that office, I think we need to look at the prioritization of efforts and make sure that they are focused on where they need to be focused. So I will be supporting the motion. However, I would like to look at the prioritization of projects. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, any other um, comments or discussion? Ms. Mack? Um, I have to agree with uh, Mr. Kuhn. I take great pride in reviewing everything carefully before I vote, and I have not had the time to do that. So I won't be supporting this simply because I haven't taken, had the time to do the type of due diligence that I typically do. Thank you. Hearing no other questions or discussion, um, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Abstain. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have Budget Committee. Mr. Kuhn? All right. Um, the next Budget Committee meeting will be on February 16th. And I believe it's going to start a half hour early at 5 instead of 5.30. Um, we'll be focusing on per school spending. And we're also going to talk about, um, I believe, uh, an initial BAT um, which is uh, a transfer uh, of, of, of funds within the system. That's it. Thank you. Next is buildings and contracts. Ms. Joes. Thank you, Ms. Hen. The next building and contracts committee is on Monday, February 7th at 5 p.m. Thank you. Curriculum committee, Ms. Mack. The curriculum committee meet, uh, met on January 20th. Uh, the entire meeting was spent discussing instructional materials, including but not limited to blended and on online student courses. And we ended discussing the purchase of lumber and plywood. Our next meeting is February 17th, 2022. And the lumber and plywood is for our CTE, not for our capital budget. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Equity committee, Ms. Scott. Thank you. The uh, equity committee meeting is rescheduled and it will be January 27th at um, 4 p.m. 2022, where we will be discussing the virtual learning program. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Next, we have the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee. Ms. Pasture. Yes, thank you. Our next meeting is February 3rd at 4 p.m. Um, we will be discussing a couple of bills. Mr. Thomas just finished serving as a page in the General Assembly, and he will be uh, leading the February meeting of the Legislative and Governmental Relations meeting. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Pester. And last but not least, the Policy Review Committee. Ms. Rowe. The next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is February 14th. Thank you. Next is agenda items for future board meetings. And if I can just ask board members to raise their hand or put um, a note in the chat if you'd like to be recognized if you have an agenda item. Mr. Kuhn. 
Um, I would um, like to talk about our efforts regarding sustainability. I had a discussion um, with the Chief Sustainability Officer of Baltimore County, uh, along with um, Dr. Lynch, who's um, our Baltimore County um, education person. That, and uh, we were discussing how to work closer together and an upcoming meeting that uh, the county executive is having. And um, they were requesting that our team, uh, BC BCPS, join in that meeting to discuss the, the things that we're doing. I think we have a good story to tell. I think we need to start talking about it. Great, thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to hear more about the um, efficiency review. There were some suggested um, items in there, in particular to the board, things that we could in improve upon. And I would just like to hear more about some of the things that we're doing um, to address several of the items that were brought up in the efficiency review. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Um, I'd like to have an update at some point on senior activities and uh, end of the year senior events, spring events, spring proms, all that kind of stuff. I was talking to Dr. Lins about it earlier, um, so I'm excited to get that information out soon. And just as like a, a sort of fun topic, um, I'd like us to have icebreakers at the beginning of our meetings, just a, a, a tiny icebreaker so we can all share a little bit about ourselves and become more, um, I don't know, more personable. So thank you. Thank you. Others, Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to see an agenda item um, addressing the board's uh, um, responsiveness and the school system's responsiveness to our stakeholders. Um, over the last um, couple years, we've received tremendous amount of engagement from parents and staff and um, students. And um, I think there really should be a more formal way to process that and also to be responsive the state superintendent and the state board at the beginning of the pandemic set up a, a new process and um, in order to address all of it and even aggregate it and then share it at their meetings, their state board meetings. So <clears throat> I would like to see an agenda item about the possibilities for that. Um, and I am also um, excited about hearing about the end of the year, especially given the great news that we heard from Ms. Somerville. Um, about the COVID reduction, and we're hoping that that continues. Thank you. Thank you. Any last items um, for discussion? Dr. Hager, do you want to share? No, I just say I tied to the chat that every time I say school meals, so I wasn't going to say it again out loud, but um, I'll say it again out loud. Um, I would love a school meals update, and I added that maybe we could also ask Food Nutrition to cater the the meal, which is something that other school districts do for different meetings so that the adults can eat the food the kids are served and they can see yeah. what it's like. So. Neat idea. Thank you. <laughs> can I request strawberry milk? That's my favorite. <laughs> Great. Hearing no further items, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, February 8th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.